And it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Hal Stewart and Dr. Craig Harry of the Stewart Center for Biorejuvenation Dental Medicine, which was established in 2014. Co-founders Dr. Hal Stewart and Dr. Craig Harry saw both young and established dentists who were frustrated with the current state of their practices. It was their desire to create a comprehensive course that would give doctors a logical step-by-step approach to rehabilitating even the most broken down dentition while staying free of the limitations put on them by insurance companies. Teaching minimally invasive techniques was also a priority. The goal of the Stewart Center is to provide an intimate learning center for dental professionals who want to profoundly impact their patients' health in significant ways, the opportunity to practice in an insurance and third-party free environment, to acquire the confidence and ability to diagnose, treat, restore failing dentitions in a systematic and predictable way, to learn state-of-the-art minimally invasive techniques. Let me introduce each one individually because you're looking at uh, two men, Dr. Craig W. Harry, DDS, who is um, the second vice president of the American Dental Association. How cool is that? He is the president of Dental Health by Harry, co-founder and co-director of the Stewart Center for Biorejuvenation Dental Medicine. The journey that brought Dr. Harry to partner in the formation began over three decades ago in his Leewood, Kansas practice. He had provided comprehensive care with a focus on life enhancing rejuvenation dentistry for over 10 years. To accomplish this, he completed hundreds of hours of continuing education at prestigious schools like the Panky Institute, the Schuster Center right here in uh, Scottsdale, and Oronathic Biostetics International, OBI. As an expert in the field, Dr. Harry has served as president of the Kansas Dental Association, chairman of the peer review committee in the Fifth District Dental Society, fellow in the American College of Dentists, and as a teacher at OBI. He is also a member of the ADA, American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, American Academy of Oral Medicine, Sports Dentistry, and the Johnson County Dental Society. Dr. Hal Stewart, DDS, FACD, is the CEO. Uh, is a biological and systems focused dentist and believes that the focus of treatment should be to achieve and maintain a healthy and functioning chewing system. He believes that a healthy dentition is only part of a healthy body and so he focuses on treating problems such as neck and shoulder pain, headaches, clenching and grinding that are often caused by dental problems. He has completed the entire curriculum of the Oronathic Biostetics International OBI Foundation at biostetics.com and has also served on the teaching facility at OBI. He has studied exclusively at the Panky Institute for Advanced Dental Studies and completed the Advanced Aesthetic and Master Aesthetic course at the Las Vegas Institute for Cosmetic Dentistry. Um, he lectures extensively teaching dentists across the country and even around the world about advanced restorative and cosmetic dentistry. He currently serves as a mentor at the Schuster Center for Professional Development in Scottsdale, Arizona and is a past president and current board member of the Texas um, Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry and is a member of Oronathic Bioesthetics International, American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, the ADA, and the AGD. Gentlemen, thank you so much after a long, hard day at the office. Uh, instead of going home, uh, to come talk to my homies for an hour. Thank you so much for joining the show. It's a pleasure, Howard. Happy to be here, Howard. You know, when you when um you talk about insurance free, I I, I want to I want to start there because the bottom line is um the average American between the ages of sixteen and seventy will buy thirteen new cars with the median average price of thirty three thousand dollars, and then when someone comes in and their whole mouth is shot almost all the dentists will just point to the most broken down tooth there is and say, well, that of all your crappy teeth, that's the worst one. So let's just fix this one because your insurance will only pay for a thousand and then you won't get another thousand till next year. So we're just going to fix the worst one. Could you imagine walking on a car lot and they say, well, you know, buddy, you should really just walk or take the bus. Let me give you, let me give you a bus schedule so you can catch the bus at Phoenix. There's no sense spending $33,000 on a new car. So tell me, why is it that 5% of the American dentists of the numbers I've seen have done one or more full mouth rehabs at $33,000 or more and 95% of dentists will never do it one time in their life? First of all, do you agree with those numbers? Yeah, I agree with them, Craig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, it depends on how you define full mouth. Yeah. 
Well, well what, 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 my, my definition of full mouth is that, you know, with the, when you walk in there, you, you just sit there and say, here's everything the dentist and the hygienist discuss. You need, you got these gum issues, you need cleanings, you need these fillings, crowns, root canals. Here's the whole case. So I guess what I mean is the whole case dentistry, as opposed to, you know, they start off doing one tooth dentistry, insurance driven, and then maybe they'll go up to like quadrant dentistry. And then a few will say, well, if I'm going to numb up the right side, might as well do the whole right side and come back and do the left side. As opposed to the dentist who just doesn't think about the insurance. Then when he gets to the fee, Instead of saying, you know, it's 20, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, it says, by the way, you have insurance, that's great, they'll pay a thousand, and the rest of it, you have great credit, and just like when they sell cars, and uh, you know, if uh, you've been approved, and for $185 a month for 60 months, we can do everything today that the doctor and the hygienist talked about. I mean, that, that's what I mean by comprehensive dentistry as opposed to insurance-driven one-tooth dentistry on an American population who doesn't blink at spending $1,000 for an iPhone. Yeah. Well, Howard, do you know the last time that I thought about insurance? When was that? The last time I, the last time I thought about insurance was in 1994. That's the day that I quit taking insurance. And I think it's a mindset. There are plenty of people out there that want to have the finest dentistry that, that's available. Um, and they're searching for people, for doctors that will provide that for them. But there's the insurance companies have uh, interjected so much fear and dependency on upon dentists that it's you know it, it the 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 pendulum has swung to that side and it's you know i've i've relegated to the fact that right now that we're gonna you know just the, the dentists that we train are the ones that want to get out of that trap of, of insurance so what i tell them is that if the analogy I use is if you buy a new house and the, the, you've got a, this you know huge backyard and it's overgrown with weeds and the trees are dying and you know some of them have uh, branches that are breaking off and you know the, you, you, you bring a, a landscaper in and he says, you know, I'm going to plant a rose bush over in that corner and replace that dead rose bush over there. You do it, okay, well, that looks really nice. And then another gardener comes up and you know, says, I'm going to trim that tree over there. Well, two or three, four years down the road, you're, it's not any better than it was before. You've got to have somebody come in with a plan because it's a system. So what we, what Craig and I both describe to is what we do is treat a system that involves airway, nerves, muscles, teeth, the brain. You, and and you, you have to look at it that way. And you have to be, you, you have to get insurance completely out of your mindset. And I'm not saying that flippantly. I realize that there's a lot of young dentists that get out of school and they've got a big debt. And, you know, the the, the thought of, of, you know, starting a practice and spending, you know, $800,000 to, you know, start a practice or 500 and they feel like they need to get, uh, you know, on PPOs and HMOs and all that stuff to get patients in the door. But then, Two years down the road, they're prisoners to all that. And it doesn't have to be that way. I think it's the insurance companies have got dentistry exactly where they want them, if you ask me. But, but it doesn't have to be that way for those that want to get out of it. It really doesn't. There's so many patients out there that want to do it the, the right way. They want to buy the new car you know, in, in, in for their mouth. Yeah, you know, my, but, um, how far are you yeah, away, uh, how far away are you from Beeville? Have you even heard of Beeville? Yeah, no, I, my cousin lives in Beeville. I know where it is. That's where four, yeah, that's where 80% of my grandchildren live. And, and you're in Flower Mound, uh, Texas, which is basically, you know, I grew up in Wichita, which if you just take 35 up to Oklahoma City to Wichita, from there to there, I mean, that yeah. that's flyover state America. You're doing this not in Beverly Hills or Key Biscayne or, or downtown Manhattan. You're, you're doing this uh, in, in a flyover state. And I, I remember having lunch just up. Um, last time I was visiting my mom, Wichita, I was, and I was, I visited some dentist in a small town. He was telling me, ah, there's no money out here. And we were eating at a Mexican restaurant in a town of about 5,000. 
And I looked out the window and I said, look over there at that, uh, uh, what are they called? They're not Circle K 7-Elevens, they're Quick Tops, Q Quick Stops, is that what they're called? Quick, quick trips. trips. Quick Trip. Yeah. And here's this town, didn't, I said 5,000, they probably didn't have 2,500. And I said, how many, how many trucks are over there right now at that Quick Stop? How many cars? There were six trucks and they were all F-150s. I think one of them was an F-350. I said, every truck at that Quick Trip is thirty-five, forty thousand dollars, and I knew that F three fifty was a hundred grand. I said, "You say there's no money, but how do all these people out here have money for a thirty-five thousand dollar F one fifty or a ninety-eight thousand dollar F three fifty? And like I say, you're doing this in Flower Man, Flower Mound, Texas. Yes, and Greg's doing it in Leewood, Kansas. Leewood, Kansas. Yeah, but that's the richest city in in the world, isn't it? Leewood, Kansas. <laughs> Howard, you said something a minute ago, very profound. Comprehensive dentistry. We, we, you, your first question you asked was full mouth. What's a full mouth? I love your definition of any complete treatment plan that is a complete plan that you, that you complete on somebody, including scaling, root playing, perio, whatever it is. We have to keep in mind that the things we're trained for in dental school are exactly what insurance covers. Operative dentistry, crown and bridge, uh, dentures, perio, all that kind of thing. The, the what we teach, uh, or the, the the niche that we have found, when you talk about TMD, occlusion, airway, and how all that marries together, and, and holistic and health related dentistry. Guess what? That's not covered by insurance. Now that's unfortunate for patients in some ways, but we're working in an arena that's outside the traditional dental model. And if 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 we can establish um, you know, some credibility with the patients and, and help them in ways that nobody's ever been able to and look at their whole body and the whole system, people are willing to pay for that because it is out of pocket. And they always ask about how much my insurance is going to cover. And you say nothing, <laughs> maybe 1500, maybe a thousand, but it, it's an interesting concept. So now just in case there's any guests, guests confused, you used to be called the Texas Center for Occlusal Studies. And now um, you're the um, Stewart Center for Biorejuvenation Dental Medicine. Why, why the change of names? Well, two, two things. Um, Craig, Craig and I, you know, Craig has ever been as much a founder of this than I, as I am. And, uh, and, and a, a dear friend, a, an unbelievable dentist, but Craig's, um, Greg's passion in dentistry, besides this, he loves teaching, is being involved in the political part of dentistry and the ADA, and I and I admire him so much for that. So Craig, you know, after becoming the um, vice president of the second vice president of the ADA, um, he's he's really focusing on that, and but still teaching, and the teaching center was here in Texas at my teaching center next to my office, and I started thinking, who are the, you know, dentists, what do they think of when they go for quality education? Spear, Panky, Kois, Dawson. Dentists like to put a name together with uh, a, a philosophy. And in, uh, when we were going through OBI, Craig and I, it was Dr. Bob Lee out of Loma Linda. And so I, with a, a lot of uh, prayer and a lot of uh, discussions with my mentor, Mike Schuster. Howard, you know Mike very yeah, well. Yeah, he was on um, He was on show number uh, 544. Yeah, about, <laughs> about a year ago. I remember that. Yep. But Mike Mike told me that he, he, he said, Hal, he said, you, you should put, you know, when you put your name on something, you put it out there. It's... You can't hide behind anything, it's you. So I talked with Craig, said, Craig, will you be okay with this name change and brand change? Craig said, Hal, you know, whatever we need to do to uh, facilitate this. And so, you know, that, whether it was a good idea or bad idea, uh, the end of last year, we decided, or the end of 2017, that, that uh, fell into place and we changed the name so that we can, um, so it's more personal, you know, I've got my name on it, I'm responsible, and we're gonna, uh, 
You know, I'm always here for, for our doctors, anybody that wants to talk. And Craig is too. So uh, that's what, that's the name change. The reason we went to dental medicine is because over the last five years, we have really realized that occlusal issues and TMJ issues are so intimately related with airway, which is also intimately related with the comorbidities that, uh, that obstructive sleep apnea, snoring can produce that this is, we are dental physicians and this is dental medicine. We're not tooth doctors. And we want to get dentists away from just looking at individual teeth and looking at a, a much bigger picture of how we can profoundly affect people's lives. And we don't have to cut 28 teeth. A full mouth rehab for Craig and myself, the majority of full mouth rehabs we do might involve what, Craig? One or two crowns? In each patient, or not yeah. A lot of them don't. We're we're not doing any subtractive. We're doing all additive with the wonderful magic of adhesive dentistry and composites. So it's very it's minimally invasive, but we're addressing the entire system, and we're looking at airway, joints, occlusion. We're looking at everything, and that's what we teach our residents. We teach them to be become dental physicians. True, true or false? It seems seems like when I talk to, I mean, it depends on what you're talking about on a child. When they walk right out of school, I tell them, look, you know, you're going to watch the Super Bowl this weekend, but you know, you you need to go out and just learn how to pass and catch and block and tackle. I mean, you're not ready for the flea flicker play in the Super Bowl, and um, and you know, they they just need to they just need to get their hands wet. I mean, a lot, a lot of these kids graduate and they can do their entire dental school. Uh, recommended um, um, requirements every month or, or two, but as they as they start to get down, you know, giving a anesthesia and fillings and crowns and root canals, you know, they they tell me that um, the most confusing thing to them is not pediatric dentistry, endodontics, surgery. It's occlusion. Why why is that so? Why, why is that so confusing? And, and, and I want to ask you if this is true or not. If I went to lunch with five endodontists, they wouldn't really argue about much. If you went to lunch with a bunch of pediatric dentists, they'll, maybe they'll argue on whether or not they like silver diamine fluoride. But man, you go to, you go to lunch with five occlusion guys. I mean, it, it's like five world religions. Why, do, you, do you agree with that assessment or not? No, I... I agree. Yeah. I know. I know Craig does too. I I, I I heard a lecture at Greater New York two years ago, and he told a story about Pete Dawson was lecturing somewhere, and Pete said, "In my younger days, I would meet with uh, Niles Gush, uh, Gush, uh, what's his name, uh, Niles okay. Gush, and you know, and he said we'd go into a room, and when we'd leave, there'd be blood on the walls. <laughs> and that's about." <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, you brought up something uh, just a little bit ago, Howard, about dental school training. And by the way, we're fellow UMKC people. Right. Uh, we had good clinical training, and you know, in our in our uh, dental school, we actually got a lot of repetitions. And I happen to have a son that's in practice with me, and he's a UMKC grad also. Uh, however, his his reps that he got in school, and you know, with Indo and Crown and Bridge and all that, was way way less. I think there's less patience in dental schools. It's just more difficult to get your requirements. So, they do have to develop repetitions when you get into practice, and you know, you can't just jump right out and be an occlusion guru or something like that. So, I mean, there's still a need to go out and be a general dentist and and get your practice in and all that. But what we're trained for in dental school is really very mechanical. If we see a hole in a tooth, we want to fix it. If there's a missing tooth, we want to replace it. And that's just where we're trained. And many, many dentists stay in that forever, never, never. The What we're trying to tell dentists is to put the handpiece down. Stop and think for a minute. Take a look at what you're doing here because you're you're dealing with a human being behind that set of teeth. And believe it or not, those teeth are connected to their entire body. And whatever goes on with the the teeth generally uh, affects the rest of the system. So we're trying to get people to slow down, think, and and study what's going on. Now, occlusion is another interesting issue because we've got there might be five different occlusal teaching uh, philosophies in the United States and around the world. And all of them are relatively the same except for one. And there's a lot of different ways that you can go about dealing with occlusion. And many of them are successful for the most part. But what we use is something that's very predictable. And we can take the 
Uh, I think the mystery out of what centric relation is and the mystery out of occlusion, because we, we take it and, and I don't know, just boil it down and it, it's really not that difficult once you understand it. And that's what you call the stable condylar, condylar position SCP or CR? That's correct. And That's when correct. you said there were five uh, uh, clusal camps and four were similar and one was different, um, be more specific. What what are what are those five and what is the one that's more different? Well, I mean, I think we look at uh, you know the the Panky Institute, and you can kind of put Dawson in that too because they are their pedigree is very similar to it. Uh, I think uh, Frank Spear and John Coys have you know a similar philosophy, but maybe a little bit different. Uh, OBI is a centric relation based occlusion. And then you've got LVI that, uh, you know, they work in a different condylar relationship as a general rule, more of a nathological relationship. Uh, so, you know, the, I think most of them are similar other than uh, what LVI teaches, and that's not necessarily right or wrong. So, I'm so you'd, say, that that's, you'd say Spear, Pinky, Dawson, Coise, OBI, Nash, Schuster, Hornbook, Strupp is probably all CR, and then just Dickerson and LVI would be neuromuscular? Would that be a fair way? Yes. I think that's a fair way. Now, we get CR differently, and we call CR something differently, but uh, yeah, I think so. Wow. Um, it, very, very interesting. So, so a lot of the kids tell me, oh, so what's in, what would you say then? The kid comes out and says, I know I need to learn more occlusion. Would you recommend... Um, well, I I know you're going to recommend the Stewart Center for Biological Medicine. You'd recommend Harry and Stewart of the Stewart Center for Bio, Reju Bio Rejuvenation Dental Medicine. But on the two camps, uh, you guys are CR, so a Spear, Pinky, Dawson, Coise, OBI, Nash, Suster, Hornberg, Strupp. Or would you recommend neuromuscular? Because I know you have experience at LVI. So how, how do you, how, what would you say to a young child who's 25 and says, should I learn CR or neuromuscular? I mean, they can't afford all these camps or $400,000 of student loans. They, they can't do everything. So what would you recommend for the first step? Um, what I would re recommend for the first step is to read everything you can read about biology. And I will tell you, I'll, I'll tell you my definition of of, uh, of of centric relation, my definition of centric relation, our definition that we adhere to uh, at the Stewart Center is, and it's very specific, but there, and there's a reason for it. It's when all the teeth are in complete occlusion, MPI, the inferior belly of the lateral pterygoid muscle is passive. When you can achieve that, then you're you're in centric relation. It's not necessarily an exact position because people's condyles are in different, uh, of, 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 they're, they're in different levels of degeneration. Um, centric relation for a, you know, a 16 year old with condyles that are not resorbed at all is it, the positional, uh, uh, the position of those condyles is, might be a little bit different than someone that's 50 that's got very flattened and eroded condyles. But when we can stabilize the condyles so that when the teeth are together or when they come together on our orthotic, they, the medial pterygoid inferior belly, I mean the inferior belly of the lateral pterygoid is passive. That's biologically the way that it should work. And that's where we agree, you know, are in the same camp with Dawson and Panky. Uh, if you read Dawson's book, that's exactly what he subscribes to the inferior belly of the lateral pterygoid is passive when all the teeth are together. So that's our goal with, with every patient. What we subscribe to is we don't do anything until we know the condyles are stable, until we know that we achieve that position with an orthotic, then we make the final restorative uh, diagnosis. Uh, now to get your diagnosis, um, there's a lot of uh, occlusion camps that sell Ten or fifteen thousand dollar machines. Uh, some occlusal camps say standard of care is a CBCT. Um, again, she's four hundred thousand dollars in debt. She's starting up her own practice. What type of um, heavy duty equipment would she need uh, to follow you? Articulating paper. 
<laughs> That's a total Kansas answer. Make it faster, simple. <laughs> Make it faster, easier, simple, higher quality for a lower price, or don't do it. But you're just saying articulating paper. No, yeah. What I, you know, Howard, really the uh, the the world's changing fast, and technology is really getting better and better. Uh, certainly. Uh, you know, we're starting to use CBCTs for occlusion. We've used it for airway and joints for a long time, but you know, we're gonna be mounting cases virtually at some point, that's not quite there yet. We're gonna be waxing cases virtually and doing these cases virtually. But in, in honestly, now we're, we're still articulator based, we're still wax based and we still build things that way. Uh, so it's not, it, you know, technology does not, is not expensive for what we're doing at this point in time. And, and going back to what you do if you're this young person who's got 400 grand in debt, by the way, the average indebtedness is 287,000 right now. Now, now when, 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 when you say average, average means mean. Um, the mean. The mean, not the mean, be, because it seems like, the, you know, like, uh, like let's just say my four boys don't have any student loan debt. Um, so, you know, some, some people, you know, their dad paid for it on a credit card. Um, um, is that you, you said the, the you said the average was how much money two hundred and two eighty seven two eighty seven that of a graduating dental school now that be the maybe the mean but well if it's the mean then you're factoring in all the people who didn't have any debt because their father was a dentist and paid for it but of the people that do have debt it would be the, the what I'm curious about do you know which number that is is that the is that the I, you know what. I can get it for you. Okay, okay, do, do it. Yeah, that'd be great. In fact, you should come back on the show and tell me, we should do another one. You should come back on the show with the president of the ADA. And we can- uh, I'll we, absolutely do it. And Jeff we, Cole and I will do one. Well, would you do that? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because um, um, I'm a big fan of the ADA. I mean, when, when people complain about the ADA, I said, look, I can complain about my mom and dad all day long, but they're the only parents I have. And I've been a due paying member every year forever because when my mom cried at my graduation, it's because the American Dental Association made it such a prestigious profession. And if you take, and, and what the ADA, the only thing the ADA does wrong is they don't market all their state by state fights and battles all day long to all their members, which they don't understand how America works. If you want a bill passed, you better have some big bills to hand out. And if you're not fighting every little piece of legislation, then, um, you're not gonna save your profession. Do you agree with that or disagree? I do, and I gotta be honest with you, our advocacy at the ADA is unbelievable. Our presence in Washington, D.C. We've got a house outside of the Senate office buildings that we're getting ready to build. We've got one on the uh, house side, and we're a big presence there in Washington, D.C. Well, so let's, let's, not, let's not go into politics now, and uh, why don't you come back with the president of ADA, and we'll talk all things all right, we'll ADA start. political, and we'll stay on the, the, um, the, the subject of occlusion, because I, the reason I was so honored you guys accepted my invitation to come on the show is because, again, I, I, I have my pulse on these dentists and occlusion is the, the most confusing thing that they ever deal with. Do you, when you call yourself um, the Stewart Center for Biorejuvenation Dental Medicine, is that also kind of like saying oral systemic health connection? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it all, it all starts with the, the airway. If you can't breathe, you can't live. So everything we do, I guess you could say it's airway centric. Okay, we're, airway we're look, air, Yeah, we're looking at the airway number one because the uh, vast majority of occlusal TMJ issues, those patients have airway issues as well. Would you not agree with that, Craig? I absolutely do. Maybe 100% of them. I, I think don't. TMJ, TMD is really a subset of an airway problem. Yeah. It's a symptom of an airway problem. So so we, we're, we're, we are always... The, the airway is the hub of the wheel and everything else centers around that. You know, now, let's just, go well, ahead. Well, I, I graduated in 1987 and from UMKC, which is, uh, I think everyone would agree on, is the best dental school in the entire solar system. And uh, I don't. I don't think. I don't. I don't think they said two things. I don't think they said two words about um, airway and all this stuff for N87. When did this really? When did this knowledge really break out? You know, Simmons, uh, Gerald Simmons down in Houston uh, lectured recently down in, in Texas for us. And uh, 
He talked about the first CPAP machine was 1991. Wow. So that way it's a primitive thing. So if you think about it, I mean, airway is brand new. Unless you're a dental student past the year 2000, you probably never heard it. So, I mean, I, we started uh, paying attention to it probably uh, eight to 10 years ago. At least it was on the radar. So it's definitely a, a, definitely a new thing. Yeah. So Howard, let me, just, let me give you an example of a, a case that I did. Uh, this case, if, if the doctors want to refer to it, was published in the October 2018 issue of Dentistry Today. And a, a, a patient came to me and he had uh, erosion and attrition. His erosion was from GERD. That was from uh, a, a secondary comorbidity of an airway issue. So we got him uh, an airway study done. We got him on a CPAP. Then we stabilized his condyles. His teeth were extremely eroded, loss of vertical dimension. All the treatment plans that he had got were uh, 28 crowns uh, with you know several root canals also planned because of uh, the fact that you know with all the crown preps the doc you know some of the dentists that had given him treatment plans had said you're probably going to need you know four five six root canals um, he'd also been diagnosed or or treatment planned full extractions and implants and and uh, and and all on four dentures. Um, Nobody had talked about his airway, his GERD. We got him on a CPAP, got the GERD under control, stabilized his condyles with an orthotic, established a new vertical dimension with, there's a process that we teach that we go through that. And then I restored his entire mouth with 26 composite, direct composite resins and two crowns. And those were just replacing two old crowns he had. And uh, again, that case is, was published in the uh, 2000, uh, October 2018 um, Dentistry uh, Today, uh, Damon Adams uh, publication. And uh, that is a typical way that we look at a case. We go, we diagnose from the inside out. Dentists want to start working on teeth immediately. But when I looked at this guy's mouth, I wish I could show you the case. Um, I look, you know, it, there was something more going on than just clinching and grinding and him wearing his teeth down. So we identified those issues. Of course, the diagnosis for his sleep issue and GERD were made by his physicians, but we prompted the, the, the sleep study. And uh, he went and had a sleep study at my, uh, at Dr. Simmons that Greg was referring to in Houston. And I uh, was diagnosed, put on a CPAP. We got that under control. Now we can do the dentistry that we need to do. And the guy's two years out now with 26 composite, full mouth composite resins and two crowns, and he's doing great. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, the way that we look at things that, that when we're talking about dental medicine, we're not, you know, we're not treating airway. We're not diagnosing all that, but we have a team that we work with. Craig's got a team the physicians he works with. I have a team that I work with. We work with physical therapists, neurologists, pulmonologists, um, but we're really doing what's best for the entire system and health of the patient. And then, you know, it was really, you know, I'm down here in Scottsdale where you taught at the, um, the Mike Schuster Center. And it's interesting how Scottsdale also has a Mayo Clinic and so does Florida. And it was the Mayo Brothers who um, really first realized, um, you know, most before the Mayo Brothers came onto the scene, I mean, when you got old and sick, people just thought, well, you're, you're old and sick. And it was the Mayo Brothers, it blew their mind that here was this 80 year old grandmother that had spent her whole life on this small grains farm and paid off all of her bills. And the family was willing to sell the entire farm and give it to a, a hospital if they could save grandma. I mean, you know, when I grew up in um, in Wichita, Kansas, you know, if you got too old, uh, they wouldn't take you to the doctor and you got sick, they just take you to the vet and put you down. And it was the Mayo Brothers who realized, hey, people value health care. True wealth is just health. And it was the Mayo Brothers yeah. that these people will sell the farm to save an 85 year old grandmother. And so it really comes down to values. Uh, so, and it really comes down to the new patient exam. So mo so here's, here's what you're dealing with. Everybody listening to you right now, under 30, if they have their office or their associate somewhere, someone calls up and says, yeah, um, 
I want to get my teeth clean and I want to do that with uh, Dr. Harry and uh, I just want to make an appointment to get my teeth clean. And the receptionist says, okay, uh, how about Thursday at one? And she comes in at one o'clock, they pop bite wings and try to do the cleaning and try to rush everything in one hour. And then they run to get the doctor and say, hurry up, you know, I'm down to five minutes. And he goes in there, looks at the bite wings, no cavities or has one cavity and that's the exam. I have a feeling that's not how you do your new patient exam. <laughs> so so I so I want you to address this. The the the, the nuts I'm going to hold your feet to the fire. The customer is always right they say and they're calling your office Dr. Harry and Dr. Stewart and say I want to get my teeth cleaned. What is the first appointment like? Do you do you grant that wish or do you say no, you have to have a uh, so so uh, new patient cleanings. Edumacatus. Well, I mean if you, if you look at that in the true sense of the word, a cleaning is a diagnosed procedure. You can't just assume somebody needs their teeth cleaned. Uh, some of the state dental boards actually won't even allow that to happen unless it's been diagnosed and recommended by the doctor. However, uh, and I know Hal and I differ just a little bit in how the patient enters the practice, but both of us do consultations first. Uh, we'll do a persona non grata, a pro bono evaluation just for 30 minutes, or we'll bring the patient in and do a uh, comprehensive oral evaluation first before we do anything, before we touch the patient. We don't generally include hygiene on the first visit unless it's after we've done the comprehensive evaluation. What's amazing is uh, I had a dentist in uh, that taught at UMKC uh, a couple days ago and you know he's in his 70s now. Uh, he just came in to, he, he said his oral appliance broke and he needed a new one, I don't make those. But he also just wanted his teeth clean. I started probing around in there because I do the probing on the initial uh, new patient and everybody does it differently, that's how I do it. And you know, there were some six and seven millimeter pockets and there was some bleeding and he had no idea, never even seen that before. So if you bring this guy in for a profi, what happens? All of a sudden your hygienist panics, starts probing, it's bleeding all over and comes in and says, what should I do? He needs more than having his teeth cleaned. So, I mean, just think, make the analogy of going into a physician for the first time and, you know, you get to see the doctor for five minutes at the very end. They, they take a look at everything and say, well, your blood pressure is a little high, but it'll probably be okay now. Let's just watch that. I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, it is amazing what you can uncover out of a 21-year-old who's healthy, seemingly, and you start looking around and you find out that they've actually started to wear their teeth down. Uh, they've got upper airway resistance syndrome, they've got erosion going on, all these different things could be happening and you totally miss that, which doesn't do any good for your practice, but it also doesn't do any good for the patient. You know, we think of the oral systemic problem, everybody thinks that's a periodontal issue and it is, you know, the you know coronary artery disease and periodontal disease and all that, but it goes way, way, way beyond that. We have the ability to impact so many things for people, it's just unbelievable. Well, and, and also Howard, it's not something that you know, the, and this is specifically towards the, not even the young dentists, but, you know, the dentists have been out there for, you know, two, three years, five years, 10 years. What you have to do is create a mindset in your practice. Craig and I need one. I, I can't remember the last time Marianne, my office manager, came back and said, we had a patient call that wanted to get their teeth cleaned. When people call my office, they don't, they never ask that anymore. So there's, there's about a, you know, two to three or four, maybe even five year period, that if a doctor wants to take his or her practice from an insurance-based, commodity-based, tooth-based dental practice to one that's dental medicine, there's a growing period in there. And you've got to have the tools to deal with those patients that do call for a cleaning. Because I did it, I, luckily I did it 25 years ago when I was only out of dental school for two or three years. Um, and it, there's a two or three year period where you, you struggle and you know you, you stick to your convictions though and your passion about what you wanna do. I can't, Craig, when was the last time you had a patient call your office and say, I hear y'all really good, I wanna clean. I mean, that never happens in my practice anymore. So there's a Cadillac so here in, in Dallas called Sewell Cadillacs. And they, right. they are a reputation of, you probably have heard the name, Howard. People that go to Sewell Cadillac go for a reason because they want what they're selling. So you've got to, that that's where you go with, with this. Now, what was his but name again? To, what was his name, the Cadillac guy? Sewell, S-E-W-E-L-L. S-E-W-E-L-L. -L. What, what was his first yeah. name? 
you remember his first name? No, I can't remember. But what, he, what I loved about him, that, which was so genius, is um, I, I read his autobiography 20 years ago. When someone would take in their car, this little trick was so amazing. When people would take in their Cadillac to get fixed, all the other Cadillac dealerships would put him in some cheap rental car. He'd say, what are you doing? I'm going to put him yeah. in the brand new Cadillac. And then, then at the end of yeah. the day, I'm going to say, um, do you want to come in and pick up your old Cadillac? Or do you want me to drive over to your house and pick up a check uh, for 25 grand? We'll keep your old Cadillac. We'll trade in. And for 25 grand, you can upgrade to your new one. And then the other thing that was so neat about him is he actually went to 100 customers that had bought a Cadillac from him and looked at their bathroom because he said a Cadillac person doesn't want to come in and use the bathroom at Walmart or the IHOP. And he made his bathrooms look like his customers. I mean, he, he, was, he was just an amazing man, but he sold more Cadillacs than uh, anybody in the United States. And he was in Dallas, Texas. Yeah. Great. But well, I tell young dentists, I have a lot of young dentists that come and they shadow me. I say, find every dentist that you you know search around that doesn't take insurance that has the kind of practice that I have you're here for a reason and go spend time with them look at what they're doing look at what they're saying look at what they're how they talk to their patients all the all the doctors that I know that do what Craig and I do or maybe they have a little bit different philosophy but their insurance independent they don't depend on insurance and they have these incredible practices, they all have three things. Passionate, believe in what they do, and they're excellent communicators. And that, I would tell a dentist, if you wanna be successful, whatever kind of dentistry you do, learn how to communicate, and learn how to communicate with patients and give them what they're looking for. They're not looking for dentistry. Patients wanna have, Mike Schuster always says, patients want as little dentistry as possible. That's what they really want. They want to feel good. They want to be. They want. They, they don't want to hurt. They don't have pain anymore. They want to be. Uh, they want to feel attractive. We can do that for them. They might want to just be able to have a good night's sleep. We can help them with that. So, so we have to. There's when you say you're airway centric. You know. Um, you know, a lot of people put TMD, occlusion, sleep apnea, snoring, and appliance therapy in one category. Would you say it's airway centric, sleep apnea, snoring, then TMD occlusion? I mean, is there any, you know, um, so if you're yeah. airway centric, would sleep apnea and snoring and appliance therapy come before TMD and occlusion? Or how, how would you uh, put that in order? It, Howard, that is such a great question. And you do see, sort of the TMJ uh, gurus in major cities are also, you know, trained in sleep dentistry. And the, the way we deal with that is, and Hal alluded to this earlier, is we diagnose from the inside out and we and we diagnose the fact that there is an airway problem. And before we start putting them in a down and forward appliance or something to treat them, we get more information and try to find out everything that's going on. Because what I said earlier is, TMD really in most cases, unless they've had an injury or something, is a symptom of a improper airway and that's maybe developed from even their infancy, uh, inability to nurse, um, you know, large tonsils and adenoids as a child, their maxilla didn't grow, there's all these different kind of things that can happen. And so really, uh, TMD is, is not necessarily standalone, is really our current thinking and that airway is the biggest problem. Now we deal with that differently when you talk about appliance therapy. Uh, the, I would say probably 95, 98% of people that treat airway as a dentist make some for sort of a mandibular anterior repositioning and appliance. And you know we, we know how to make those. We generally don't. We deal with TMD more from a cure standpoint where we want to you know, get them to the orthodontist and expand the arches or we get them to an oral surgeon and an orthodontist and do an MMA or some sort of surgery where we can give the tongue more room because essentially you just don't have a big enough tongue box for your tongue. I, I don't want to get too sidetracked off this, but the one thing that I keep reading over and over and over is it's not even coming from dentistry. It's the anthropologists who keep finding, um, you know, 30,000 year old Neanderthal and Denosovans um, the 23andMe doing the DNA tree. And so many of these anthropologists are saying, 
You know, humans are, homo sapiens are 2 million years old and it looks like all these malocclusions just recently popped up over the last couple hundred years. I mean, you, you don't you don't find these malocclusions. They, and a lot of them are saying they think it's because um, babies used to nurse for four or five years. And now when a baby has any difficulty nursing, they switch to a big bottle. We're just guzzling in or a sippy cup. Um, the food is all pureed in a little jar of Gerber's. They're not chewing. And so they're not getting any forces on their maxilla. They're not. And so then these kids, I mean, we have, United States has, 10,800 full-time orthodontist putting everybody through this machine um, because they didn't get any forces on their face. The, the kid never picked up a bone and had to chew on it for uh, nutrition, trying to get some meat off or roots or berries. Uh, do you do you think that the, uh, and we see it in allergies too, where in the 1 billion of, of, of earthlings that live in the richest um, communities, have all these allergies where the other six, six billion kids that are growing up crawling around the dirt um, who are getting exposed to all this antigens uh, that they have better immune systems do you, do you think our diet do you think using a bottle a sippy cup and eating gerber's baby food is a large um reason all these um muscular skeletal tmd problems sleep apnea is popping up yeah i do i mean i have no no doubt in my mind that that's the case if you look at if you go back in history and you look at the when the and the industrial revolution from that point forward you, you look at from a dental standpoint what started happening that's you can pinpoint it back to that weston price you know you i'm sure you're familiar with weston price you've ever read his book i firmly believe ge genetically we have all the right genes to 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 produce what we need to produce but the epigenetics is what's out there's like environmental factors Nursing, I think, is huge. You got so many babies now that are they nurse for a while, then they start bottle feeding, and that's that's huge. Um, diet, I think, diet is probably uh, as big a factor, if not bigger, than than the the, the nursing part. They're both huge. Uh, if, if you if someone said you had to pick two things, those were the two that I would pick. It's really weird. If I was an orthodontist, I, I'd be or a pediatric dentist. I, I'd be um, having webinars in my village about um, come in now when you're pregnant and learn how to maybe have a, uh, a more of a different diet and lifestyle where your kid won't have to go through the orthodontic uh, factory. And by the way, orthodontics, that's another thing that confuses a lot of these kids because these kids say, well, you know, you go to the orthodontist and about 25% of the time, they pull the four, four first bicuspids, which is a lot better than 30 years ago. It was about 75% of the time. And now it's about 25%. Um, they blow out the curve of speed, the curve of Wilson. And when the kids are done orthodontically, most of them come back in, they get out that articulating paper and they go, these, these teeth aren't even uh, in, in correct occlusion. What, what letter grade would you give the 10,800 orthodontist on how the occlusion is when they're all done. I, it, I'm going to, okay, I'm, I'm just going to go out there. <laughs> this is not anything personal against any orthodontist. This is what they're taught. The letter grade that I would give is an F. Are right? there any of them? What's that? Uh, yeah. okay, we not all of them. We, we, we just oh, had yeah. several several hundred uh, orthodontists from Orthotown uh, just end the podcast there. But no, I'm just kidding. But but a lot of a lot of them agree. What and why why do you give them that letter grade? Because so many people agree with you. Well, I think they're stuck in a model that is uh, a production based. They advertise and market smiles and straightening teeth rather than building. Uh, healthy occlusions and enhancing the airway and expanding. I, I tell you, going back, I think the pediatric dentists are the ones that have the biggest potential to make a difference in kids' lives because just what you said, they can market to moms before the babies are born, but they can take care of these very young children. Uh, Howard, I don't see children. I haven't seen them for 25 years. This Later on this year, probably it'll happen this year, bringing in a... Uh, I'm bringing in a partner into my practice that specifically identifies those issues in children. And we're going to start not doing pediatric dentistry, but we're going to start bringing children in and start ex growing their jaws when they're, when they're young so they don't have to put up with all these issues. 
Well, you're in Texas. So, I got I got four I got four of my five grandchildren in Beeville. So what I do is I just go to Beeville, shoot a deer, and throw it out the back door, and take away all their baby food, and just say, "Go out there and chew on that deer for a week." <laughs> To spread those <laughs> spread those jaws and maxilla and start building up those muscles uh but but it is amazing and i was at um i was at a house this uh weekend and there was a uh seven year old little boy and he was taking a nap on the couch and i mean it sounded like boulders grinding clear across the room and it didn't even dawn on anybody that there was a problem and i'm like do you do you hear him when he sleeps and they're just like, what? Oh, he always does. That's what they said. Oh, he always does that. I'm like, oh my. <laughs> I had a I had a physician and his wife in because she had, had come to me for a, a consultation. And we went on with the comprehensive exam. We did a CT, an accessor airway, home sleep study. She's having like 35, 40 apneic events a night. And we're in the consultation room and the physician wonderful people but the physician was talking about her snoring and they were laughing about it and you know he was like i've got to go and i finally after about 35 40 minutes of that i finally said okay i said let's get serious i said if we were talking about your wife has a terminal cancer would you be laughing right now i said this is a serious issue you know and it it changed the tone of the entire consultation like immediately because my dad died of Parkinson's at 85 years old. He was the healthiest Parkinson patient that his physicians had ever seen. The guy was a picture of health, but he developed Parkinson's. My dad had some severe obstructive sleep apnea. And I have no doubt in my mind that played a huge part in his, in his Parkinson's. And from when I finally started researching this, and learning more about it, I became passionate about it because it hit home. It hit me in the heart. And the the man that was the most important person in my life succumbed to, you know, I mean, we all gotta go sometime, but he didn't have to go like that. That's not a that's not a very dignifying way to go in, with Parkinson's. And he didn't have to do that. Okay, I'm gonna, so I'm it's gonna, very, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw, it. I'm gonna throw something at you that I hear on the street all the time for thirty years. Oh, I'm not gonna uh, learn all this. Uh, they're, they're gonna want me to on every new patient uh, mount up study models on an articulator. Uh, I'm not interested in that. So my question is, what percent of your new patients do you stake study models and mount them on a semi-adjustable articulator? One hundred percent. One hundred. And what percent yeah, of that? And what percent of the? There are two hundred eleven thousand Americans who have an active license to practice dentistry today. What percent of them um, did not mount up a single new patient uh, models on an articulator for all of uh, twenty eighteen, the whole year? I'd say ninety eight point. That's what I was going to say. Ninety eight. <laughs> Nine, 98. Nine, 98%. Okay, so if 98% do not do this one time in uh, all of last year, uh, so in 2019, uh, talk to my homies. Why should they take full mouth study models and mount them up on an articulator? Well, I mean, I don't think that that's not even a question. That To me, that is like a CAT scan. It's like taking bite wings in a full mouth series. It's It's data that we're collecting on the patient so that we can do uh, a part of our comprehensive evaluation and then develop a systemic treatment plan. If you don't have that, you have no idea how the, the mouth even works. Photography is the same way. You've got to have a complete set of photography that, I mean, photographs are more important than radiographs sometimes. Well, we see things through photography we miss. Well, anybody who says a CBCT is better than a pano, I have to argue with them because Man, when you show a pano to a patient, the first thing they do is they point to that R and say, is that my right side? I mean, whoever discovered putting an R on the right side and an L on the left, that was the smartest guy in all of dental radiology. Because you show them a CBCT, it's like looking at the Hubble spectrograph. Was that Mo, Larry, or Curly that decided to put the R on the right side? <laughs> it's great. You show them a pano and they get it. They just instantly get it. You show them study models and they're very, they're very intrigued because 
the radiograph is of themselves. They see all their teeth in one picture with the R and L, and then the study models. Um, but what articulator, do you guys use the same articulator? Yeah, yeah, uh, AD2 from, AD2. Uh, it's, uh, American Dental American. Technologies. American and uh, Dental Technologies, and how many of those do you guys have? I have 14 articulators. From America, yeah, of another company. They're all in use at, at the same time. So that's the articulator you recommend is the American um, American Dental Technologies articulator. Absolutely, it's. I pay it's you a, should, Howard. Here's a tip for you. Somebody you should have on is Dave Williams, who owns eighty two. He's brilliant. Who owns eighty two? Williams. So, yeah, he owns a company. Roth Williams yeah. Orthodontic. That was his dad. Okay, you well, heard of Roth? Orthodontics. Yeah, Roth Orthodontics. Roth Williams, yeah. yeah. Was that really Roth Williams? And and Bob Williams is, is Dave's dad. Bob's probably 85, 88 now, and he still lectures in China. He's amazing. But and, yeah, Dave Williams with 82. He, he, he's a great guy, makes an incredible product, and they're extremely reasonably priced. Absolutely. And he is... And you were earlier, sure. how in the in the broadcast about the, the instrumentation we use we use a condylar centering orthotic that, that we build for our patients it's a maxillary orthotic it's permissive uh, it, it's not or it's passive it, 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 it's not it doesn't force the mandible anywhere we use an instrument called the MCD measures condylar displacement that's the instrument that we use from 82 that that shows the displacement of the joint and it also sh gives us the uh, exact uh, measurement of when the joint is stable and not moving anymore and we use an 82 articulator that's our instrumentation now you're calling it an, 80, an 82 art an 82 articulator at american dental technologies a capital a capital d the number two and the company is American Dental Technologies, right, Greg? Oh, okay. Yep. yep. And is it a fully adjustable or a semi-adjustable articulator? Semi. Semi. And um, so do you, so um, you so when they take your course, you recommend that they come with an eighty-two semi-articulator um, uh, from uh, American no. Dental Technologies. Better than that, when they register for our course. It includes an AD2 articulator. They get one as part of their tuition. Huh, nice. And then, and then Dave, and then Dave Williams gives them a really nice deal and a package deal if they want to if they want to buy more. And they always do because once they start doing this, they uh, and it, and this is what separates us. Our doctors are required to complete two cases when they go through our program. They, they have to complete it. They, they don't learn it and give work lip service to us. They actually have to do it. That was very important to both Craig and myself, that we were going to teach it, but they have to do it. They have to do it, show it to us, present it to us. And once they do that, they get two cases under their belt in the year with us, then we set them free and they're, they're rocking and rolling. Um, many of the dentists that I talk to about this in particular, they just say, I'm just, I just hate sales. I, I'm not good in sales and I, I would rather just do a PPO practice where they point to a tooth and I just fix that tooth because, um, you know, dentistry, medicine and law are natural selection to people who live in libraries, who get A's in calculus and physics and geometry. Uh, they're more, they're far more likely to be introvert. And then they come out of school and you just said something um, very profound. You said that um, successful dentists are passionate, believe in what they do and are excellent communicators. Well, I mean, if you, I have flown on a gazillion miles on an airplane. And when I sit next to someone, I say, hey, describe to me um, a dentist. No one ever, ever said, excellent communicator, outgoing, charismatic. Uh, I mean, I mean, they're, they're, they're shy introvert scientists. They're, they're, they're more like an engineer and a physicist. They're, they're not into uh, um, sales. So how, what would you say to that person listening to you saying, I just can't see myself selling a big case? And I would say, 
and you don't have to. I mean, Craig and I are, self. Craig and I are both blessed that we're we are wonderful, excellent communicators. Um, you get somebody that can do it for you. Mike Schuster has always said that if you can't do it, you do the dentistry. Get someone to do it for you. But selling is you're selling. Selling is identifying the. Listen to the patient. What is your pain? What 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 pains you? Why are you here? What are you currently doing about it? Why is it not working? Obviously, what you're doing about it's not working. That's why you're here. Then you introduce yourself as the expert. You know, I say, well, I'm currently writing a book on this exact subject because I am. Or I've, uh, you know, one of the articles I had published reminds me of your case. I don't have to say, you know, I'm an expert. You say things like that, but, you know, to be honest, you, you need to be, you, you need to have the qualifications. Once you identify yourself as the expert, you tell your story. I tell the story about my own mouth, about getting restored. I tell the story about my dad dying of Parkinson's because of sleep apnea. Then you tell them about the features and the benefits of your treatment. You don't have to go into detail. Patients don't want to hear detail, but you tell them about how you do what you do in a nutshell, how they're going to benefit from it, and then the benefits from the benefit. And what I mean by that is you're going to have a beautiful, stable occlusion or bite. It's going to be, it's going to, it's going to feel great. You're going to be able to chew whatever you want. That's a benefit, but the benefit of the benefit is you're going to be healthier. You're going to have a, you're going to feel better about yourself. The esteem that you get with a beautiful smile, it functions better, but it looks beautiful as well. And then you ask them, so would you like to, what, what do you want to do about it? And then you shut the hell up and quit talking and let the patient talk. And so that's the point of saying, if you're not, if you can't do that, Find somebody that can do that for you, and then you do the dentistry. Because not everybody is a, a great communicator. I mean, you know, that's we all have our strengths and weaknesses. And and do you do any marketing or advertising, or is it all word of mouth referral? All word of mouth. I yeah, Mike, it. pretty much one hundred percent word of mouth. But you got to go out and create that word of mouth, Howard. You got to go out and meet the community. And I'm talking about the medical, dental, chiropractic, physical therapy, the people who are going to be seeing these people also. And you can, you also, general dentists, go educate general dentists, your colleagues. What, what other healthcare, like, like I'll be honest, I, I'm here in Phoenix, Arizona. And, and I'd say the last year, Awatugi, um, I live in Phoenix, but everybody here calls it Awatugi. Uh, it just, it just is what it is. In fact, if you say to someone on my uh, area, do you live in Phoenix? They say, no, I live in Ahwatukee, but Ahwatukee is Phoenix, Arizona. So the, uh, um, but anyway, um, long story short, um, I'd say in the last year, I've had dinner. Every chiropractor has come over to my house or gone to dinner, a hundred percent, they're always there. All the naturopaths, um, naturopaths, chiropractors, um, pharmacists, uh, but physicians, um, they're, they're um, I mean, most of the physicians in, in uh, where I live in Ahwatukee, they don't even have an email or any social media on, on their website. They're, they're kind of talk about in the mill. I mean, they're just, they don't want new patients. Once they sign up for Medicare or Medicaid, uh, they're so busy. They, they, they're just trying to get through the day. They, they don't want to, they don't want to listen to anybody who wants to tell you to, you know, so, so do you, did you have most luck with chiropractors, naturopaths, podiatrists, pharmacists, or did you have a lot of luck with physicians in your area? Uh, I, Hal, I don't know if you're the same as me, but I gotta be honest with you. General dentists is probably my biggest prefer. Yeah. General me dentists. Me too. And uh, DOs, osteopaths. And uh, general dentists and osteopaths is your biggest referrals. I get a lot, of, a lot of referrals from osteopaths. Yeah. yeah, I'll tell you, you know who doesn't know anything about TMJ, but they see it every single day in their practice are e ENTs. Yeah. When somebody goes in with ear pain or an ear problem and they look in the ear and it's not red, they are pretty much saying, go see your dentist, you got TMJ. But instead of doing that, they're wise enough, most of them, especially if you're going to talk to them, 
that they won't send them to their regular dentist because they understand that most dentists don't even know what the TMJ is, and they'll send them to you as their preferred referral. Huh, interesting. Uh, I can't what, what, uh, Go ahead. Every, every new patient that I see, we do a complete comprehensive exam. I write up a complete review of findings for that patient, give it to them, but I also send it to every one of their medical providers. So to their general, to their, uh, you know, uh, uh, their general practitioner, their any specialist, I send that to every single one of them. And so how many dead, how many physicians get a, a complete review of findings from a dentist about a patient? I mean, that never happens. Never. That's all you have. You start doing that in, in six months, you're going to have so many patients referred to you by physicians, you're not going to know what to do with them. Well, gentlemen, I can't, that hard. I can't believe our show's an hour and we went well over an hour. Um, uh, you guys have been so generous with your time. Um, I, is there any question that I should have asked but wasn't smart enough to ask or anything you want to talk about that I didn't bring up? All I'd like to say is that I've always admired you, Howard, from a, from afar, and uh, I I want to commend you for what you do for dentistry. Thank you. Ah, thank you. I, I am proud. Uh, Dental Town turns twenty years old on this coming St. Patrick's Day, and I beat Facebook by four years. That's <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, you are social for dentists. You are it. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's the uh, social media has been a very fun. Uh, f it's just, and I like this. I mean, gosh, I was when I was fifty years old, I didn't even know what a podcast is. Here I'm fifty six and and have a podcast in dentistry. I've always been a big fan of any technology that helps share information so that dentists can go faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost, more miniature, uh, just more. Um, you know, um, you know, I'm a big believer in capitalism and free enterprise, and I believe that. Uh, uh, I, I never set out to set up a chain of dentists because I thought finding the location and a group deal on supplies and um, and equipment and composite that that that's not what dentistry is about. Dentistry is about getting a highly educated doctor who can communicate a very trustworthy doctor patient relationship. And I don't see any scales of economy in that. I mean, I, I can see well, scales of economy as stamping out a Model T Ford, but I don't see any scales of economy of uh, lining up a thousand dentists in a row. Uh, you know what I mean? I, I think it comes yeah. down, I mean, call me old fashioned, but I think dentistry comes down to, we sell the invisible. I know when I bought a, a Starbucks coffee, or I know when I bought an iPhone or a Dell computer, I know what those are. But when I go to my doctor and he says, you have this disease, I mean, how, how do you, how do you, I mean, you have to trust the person. And it's all about the, the doctor patient relationship. It's all invisible. It's all on trust. It's all on referral. I mean, look, look at advertising. Um, there's solid evidence that says if someone comes into word of mouth referral, they'll buy three dollars, and if they come in off advertising, they'll buy one dollar, because you know they they come in there and and they don't know you from Adam, and you say I have four cavities, they're like I don't even know if I believe you. It's kind of like when my engine light comes on. It's so tempting to take it to all these other places, but I always take it to the dealer of the man I bought it from, who I've known for 20 years, simply because if he tells me I need a new transmission, I believe it. But if I went to some chain shop in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, I think this guy's a commission-based salesman. I did the same thing, Howard. That's amazing. This morning, my engine light came on. I've got a garage right across the street or in and down two blocks from my office so convenient i don't take it there i take it to the dealer uh, that i bought you now six seven cars from i trust them it's 20 miles away that's what i'm gonna do well you know that's I, what i have yeah, like your relationship I blame this all on my five sisters because I played Barbie dolls till I was 12. We didn't pull any engines <laughs> or uh, rehab a car. And uh, when the guy starts talking to me and, you know, he starts telling me what's wrong. Well, I, I can't. I think it's hilarious when he asks me if I want to see the old part. It's like I wouldn't even know what the part is. This is all a trusting relationship. Um, gentlemen, seriously. So, Al, I'll just a second. You have five sisters? Five, so two older sisters, three younger sisters. 
I have five sisters myself. Well, there's a special place in heaven for both of us. We might be sharing the room. <laughs> my, 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 my older than I am, I'm the youngest. I'll tell you what, I, I, I never sister. I never change a spark plug, out. but I know how to dress a Barbie doll 20 different ways. So uh, I, I give them credit. And cooking and baking. Oh, my gosh. In fact, I it's so embarrassing. I'll never forget some dentist at my house. But I had this big frame, this this big old um, um, in need of embroidery. And he said, oh, what is that? And it was a, it was a tree 11 or anything. He goes, oh, that, that's interesting. Uh, uh, and I looked at it. I said, yeah, I, I did that when I was like nine. And the guy goes, you were embroidery? <laughs> you know, not, pe- people don't embroidery or crochet uh, when they have five brothers. But uh, hey, gentlemen, seriously, yeah. thank you for all that you do. Um, uh, Her- Dr. Harry, I'd love it if you came back on the show with the president of the ADA and talked all things politics. Um, even though they say you're never supposed to talk about religion, sex, politics, or violence, um, we should have the president of the ADA on, and you're the second vice president, and talk about that. Because the one thing I want you to come back and talk about a lot of these kids, they tell me, they go, well, dude, I got $400,000 of student loans. I, I can't afford to join the ADA. That I can't. A subject, I would absolutely love the opportunity. And I'll bring Jeff with me. Okay, let's do it. Um, again, thank okay. you so much for coming on the show today and talking to my homies. I really, it was an honor to podcast both of you. Hey, Howard, it was a ball. Thank you.